Ship 24 has just been lifted by the chopstick arms and stacked on top of Booster 7 for the first time. This process is outrageous and impressive. Big congratulations to all of the hardworking people involved in bringing Ship 24's process to this stage. And as Eric Ralph said, while there are plenty of tiles still missing, this view also shows that SpaceX has fully repaired the damage to the heat shield tiles on Ship 24's aft flaps. SpaceX hasn't lifted a ship since last March, and this is S24's first time. It could be the reason why Starship's full stack was postponed this morning. According to Zach Golden, it appears that the chopsticks are unable to get close enough to connect the lifting pins. The new bumper pads installed on the rails with the function of protecting the booster during landing are a bit too thick. It's like when you try to put on some pounds, you try to bulk up, but then all of a sudden your clothes don't fit. Anywho, the bumper pads then had to be removed. Then, lifting Ship 24 on top of the B-7 could continue. Now, without further ado, let's take a look at how quickly Ship 24 depressurizes. That was quite the crunch, wasn't it? But no need to freak out, because this is quite normal. It happens every time the ship is depressurized. Either way, Super Heavy B-7 will be treading significantly new ground. Even before actual static fires begin, B-7 will also need to complete one or more wet dress rehearsals, a test that exactly simulates a launch, but stops just before the moment of ignition. If SpaceX attempts a full wet dress rehearsal in which the booster would be filled with more than 3,000 tons or around 6.6 .6 million pounds of liquid oxygen and liquid methane, it would be a first for Super Heavy and just as a big of a test of the orbital launch site. B-7 will also need to test out its autogenous pressurization, which replaces helium with hot oxygen and methane gas to pressurize the rocket's propellant tanks. Should this gradual testing go without a hitch, SpaceX could continue focusing on its static fire campaign, which could culminate in one or perhaps even two 33-engine static fire tests of the B-7 on the OLM. If all goes well, SpaceX's first attempt to fly Starship into orbit could happen next month. Additionally, the company is preparing for an aggressive launch schedule ahead. Booster 9 is having its first grid fin installed right now. Do note that these were Booster 8's grid fins, so that might not bode well for B-8, especially since it has lacked SpaceX's attention for a while. This vehicle was rolled to the launch site during Booster 7's upgrades. However, it hasn't undergone any notable work, such as cryo-proofing. This may be in part related to a potential refocus on Booster 9 being the vehicle to follow up on Booster 7's flight. Besides that, NASA has just given a DART mission update. Before it flew the DART spacecraft thousands of miles away from Earth towards the Didymos asteroid system, NASA criteria had outlined that a successful test would see the moonlit asteroid's path change by 75 seconds. The mission involved NASA's impactor spacecraft colliding with the moonlit asteroid Dimorphos as it used the parent asteroid Didymos to orient itself just an hour or so before impact. Footage of the impact that became available soon after impact had shown a strain of rocks trailing the moonlit asteroids which indicated that the damage had been done. Now, roughly two weeks after impact, NASA has confirmed that the mission was successful, and Dimorphos' orbit was altered by 32 minutes due to the impact, which took place at an eye-popping speed of 14,000 miles per hour. According to NASA, prior to the impact, the moonlit asteroid took 11 hours and 55 minutes to orbit the parent asteroids. After the dark collision, this period dropped to 11 hours and 23 minutes for a 32-minute change which exceeded the test's success criteria by more than 25 times. However, astronomers over at NASA aren't done with the asteroid system just yet. After confirming that the test was successful, they are now focusing on the rocks ejected from the asteroid post-collision. Due to the emptiness of space, the force of this plume of rocks also pushed the asteroid forward and helped change its orbit. The astronomers will continue to view the images sent out by DART's companion imaging satellite developed by the Italian Space Agency. This will enable them to analyze the moonlit asteroid's shape and mass. Other issues that are being studied involve analyzing Dimorphos' surface texture. After all, not all asteroids are made of hard rock. Some have a soft, sponge-like surface as well. 
In any case, NASA's successful DARP mission came as a nice distraction from the agency's repeated attempts to launch its Space Launch System rocket. After struggling with seals that connected the rocket to its launch tower, engineers were willing to give the rocket another try when disaster struck in the form of Hurricane Ian and forced NASA to roll the rocket back to its vehicle assembly building. The next Artemis 1 launch attempt is slated for November, and if successful, it will kickstart NASA's Artemis program that seeks to establish a permanent presence on the moon. And as a helping side of information, Starlink is now available in good old Nihon, or Japan, if you will. SpaceX announced it on Monday, adding that Japan is the first Asian country to access Starlink. In September of 2021, KDDI Corporation announced that it chose Starlink to deliver its high-speed, low-latency broadband internet to its 1,200 remote mobile towers. As soon as 2022, KDDI will be able to offer an urban mobile connectivity experience to its rural mobile customers, the corporation said in a statement. An experimental license has been issued by the MIC, or Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, to operate the ground station for Starlink service installed at KDDI's Yamaguchi Satellite Communication Center. Both companies have been conducting a series of technical demonstrations to evaluate its quality and performance, it added. Nikkei Asia noted that KDDI is Japan's second largest mobile provider, covering over 90% of the population with 4G communication. It also has a platinum frequency band that extends over 60% of the land area. During the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, Elon Musk mentioned two quite significant partnerships with major country telcos, or telecommunications, but didn't share the names, but KDDI is one of them, the publication added. One Asian country that doesn't want Starlink is China, according to a recent interview with Elon Musk in the Financial Times. Musk says Beijing has made clear its disapproval of his recent rollout of Starlink's SpaceX's satellite communication system in Ukraine to help the military circumvent Russia's cutoff of the internet. He says Beijing sought assurances that he would not sell Starlink in China, the publication said. And there you have it. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's top news stories involving SpaceX and NASA. Now, if you enjoy what my team and I are doing, you can become a patron through our Patreon link in the description below. Otherwise, as always, this is Kevin with Great SpaceX, and my team and I will see you next time.